Am I allowed to say bad words? Because in real life, I'm allowed to. Yeah, <laughs> it's up to you. Like, YouTube's not gonna like censor me, right? I think it should be. I think it should be okay. I don't think they. Okay. Hello, web shadowers. Thank you all for attending our session tonight. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Ben Talley, who is a Beverly Hills plastic surgeon. And as always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the chat box at the end. With that being said, Dr. Talley, you may start whenever you're ready. All right. Well, I'm ready. So let me let me cancel this thing. So uh, just so everybody knows, if you want to watch this, go on YouTube onto Web Shadowers and it's live. Okay. So not to disturb, but all right. So I'm Ben Talley. I am a facial plastic surgeon. I'm in Beverly Hills. And the way I got here, uh, I'll kind of go through before we start going through everything else, just so you have an understanding of like my training, my education. Um, I'm from LA. I was born in San Jose, but I grew up in LA. And for me, I, I always wanted to come back to LA and that's kind of what guided where I set up my practice. And eventually uh, everybody goes through this. You try to figure out where you want to live, what you want to do, or uh, are you just going to move anywhere to get the, the job you want? So uh, I specialize in uh, vascular malformations as part of what I do, but I'm mainly facial cosmetic and reconstructive surgery, meaning uh, I do facelift, cosmetic work, and reconstruction. I used to do cancer reconstruction, but now it's mainly cosmetic stuff that I do. And my life just went that way. Uh, before I went to med school, I thought plastic surgery, like no way would I ever do it. I thought it was the most superficial sounding thing in the world. And uh, I didn't really know what to make of it. So I thought it was like a distant, distant thing that I would never do. Um, but I ended up doing it. So uh, the way I got here, I went to undergrad. Let's see, I don't know if I made it. Yeah, so I went to undergrad at UCLA. Um, when I was at UCLA, and I'll, I'll kind of guide you through my process, and I'll go through cases of uh, things that I do. Uh, but when I was in UCLA, I didn't like going to school. So I was kind of the, not the dropout, but I was just never really there. Um, so I went and took all my classes at once. I graduated probably in like a year and a half, two years for all my classes and then didn't want to go straight to med school because I'm not a total nerd. So I thought, okay, I'm going to just take my time. And in that time, including undergrad, I was a private investigator for a year. I drove an ambulance. I was an EMT. Uh, and that was a lot of fun driving an ambulance back then. I was a ski patrol. So I was doing ski patrol up in uh, Big Bear, which I'm not like the best skier, but you know, good enough to do ski patrol in Big Bear. Um, I worked at a pet shelter, I ran a blood drive, I was doing a bunch of different things. I worked at guests in Beverly Center, like the guest store. So I'd walk around telling people, you know where I work? And they'd be like, what? I'm like, guests. And I just do that all the time. So that was uh, my UCLA year. So I kind of wasted time for two years. I traveled to Spain, so I did study abroad. And I, I mean, if you talk to anybody who's done study abroad, it's pretty much a must. And um, I was mentioning earlier that uh, the best thing to do at this point if you're just doing school from home is go do it in like a really nice place like go to Lake Tahoe or go Mexico go wherever has good wi-fi and then you can do it from there but it is one of the only times in your lives where you're able to do that so study abroad was great for me and it wasn't a waste in terms of like my medical uh, stuff because I went and started a blood drive there with La Hermanidad de Donantes de Sangre or something. I, I forgot what we called it. And um, learned some Spanish, which I already spoke Spanish from when I was a kid, but uh, got a little bit better and I got to travel around Spain. So came back to LA, did some private investigating again, uh, just to kind of make money. And I was still doing the uh, EMT. I worked for AMR. I was an ambulance driver pretty much and got fired like three times for not showing up, but then convinced them every time to rehire me. And then I went to med school and I went to UC San Diego, which at the time was the most malignant med school in the country. They uh, treated you the worst. They made you work harder. They gave you extra stuff to learn that you didn't need to know. And they were, they had the mentality at that point, the Dean was just like, you know, not the sweetest person and had the mentality that 
harder is better rather than trying to be more efficient and smart. So she was just like, hard work makes you smarter, which is the dumbest thing in the world. But that's how it was. So San Diego was miserable back then. We were getting killed. It was by far the hardest one in the, in the country. And when I told my friends at UCLA what we were doing, they just started laughing at me. So either way, that was, uh, it was still fun, enjoyable. And when you go through med school, that first year is uh, pretty tough. There's probably, I'd say, a high depression rate amongst even happy people. And then the second year, everything gets better. And then the third year, it gets amazing. And the fourth year, you just kind of chill half the time. So it's nice. Uh, I applied at that point. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I'm, I've always known I'm a surgeon. I wanted to be a heart surgeon originally and then realized that, you know what, that's not for me. And you start to look at the personalities of the people in different fields and you kind of match yourself with that. Like you look at neurologists, they're like bow tie wearing nerds. They, then they are. Uh, you look at psychiatrists, they're either like super lazy and chill and don't want to work or they're weirdos. You look at like neurosurgeons, they're the most type A people who don't care about sacrificing their lives at all for others. So everybody has like a different demographic and like the orthopedics uh, surgeons, they, they're like the frat boys, the ENTs and the urologists are more kind of... Uh, middle ground a little bit fashionable the urologists have more like nappy hair and you know like to play with uh, you know urology things and so you pick where you want to go and I, I i at that point decided you know what i'm going to do head and neck surgery i want to be a head and neck cancer surgeon which for me was very appealing a very sexy idea where i'm like you know what i'm going to take care of cancer i'm going to help people it's fantastic i didn't want to do orthopedics even though i i've done carpentry my whole life uh because I asked like the orthopedic chief, you know, I said, this patient has glomerular nephritis and the guy's like, what are you talking about? What is that? And I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know what that is. So as a med student, I was turned off that there was no medical knowledge. It was just kind of all surgical and ENT or head and neck surgery has kind of a mix. So you have a lot of medical and uh, you have a lot of uh, surgical mix and uh, pretty much all the pathology in the body comes out in the head and neck. If somebody has a cold, it's in the head and neck. If someone has cancer, they have head and neck symptoms. So I love that about it. And I, uh, at that point, matched at Columbia and Cornell. Uh, Columbia and Cornell was a 50-50 split program and uh, moved to New York. And that was amazing. It was five-year program, uh, best five years ever. Every time I switched from college to med school, med school to residency, residency to fellowship, I would throw a big party. I used to throw a lot of parties. And every time it was something like the funeral of my social life, or I'm dead and I'm never coming back. Some, some party like that, because I always thought like things were going to get harder and I was going to become miserable. And it was never true. I like went and I had the best time of my life when I was at Columbia and Cornell. And um, I, I was, you know, a bit uh, out of place at first because of my, the way I talk, I'm very laid back. And Columbia and Cornell, it's, it's a New York style education. They're very hardcore. And they thought that me being relaxed and chill all the time meant that I wasn't hardworking. Then they saw that I had twice as many cases as all the other people in the residency because I was working night shifts at Columbia and then working days in plastic surgery offices or road to ed. You know, I'd be doing head and neck cases. And then at night I would go cover emergency cases with a different department like oculoplastics or plastic surgery. So um, after a while they realized I wasn't a lazy ass and I was working harder than everybody else. Uh, but I was also partying harder than everybody else. So I, my two best friends were club promoters and I was out every single night, like ah, four nights a week in New York. Um, so that was five years. Halfway through uh, my head and neck dreams, uh, in the third year, I started just crying every day because I would tell people they had cancer because it was my job running the clinic. I tell somebody they have cancer, I start crying before they start crying and it became miserable for me. So I thought to myself, you know what, like, I, I was an idealist at the time and it was time to become realistic. I said, I want to save lives. I want to do things for other people, but at what expense do I want to sacrifice my own? And I said, no, you know what? Forget this. I'm just going to, you know, worry more about myself and do what I like. And so I said, you know, I'm going to do more of the facial reconstruction. So I would still deal with the cancer patients, but doing facial reconstruction. So I went into that, started focusing more on the recon. Then I saw the hardest stuff in plastic surgery or cosmetic surgery was actually the cosmetic portion. It was much harder than reconstruction for me to get it right and perfect and everybody sees what you're doing. So 
I focused a lot on cosmetic and really started following a lot of different surgeons. If I had a vacation, I would take a vacation to like Miami and then go visit surgeons and then party at night. Or I'd go to Brazil, visit surgeons, party at night. Um, and that was the way I spent all my vacations actually was trying to learn, but having fun at the same time. So by the time I graduated, I was way ahead. And uh, then I went into fellowship and I did my first fellowship uh, I was um, at uh, the uh, sorry New York Center for Plastic and Laser Surgery, which was Andrew Giacono, and we did facelifts, cancer reconstruction, uh, a lot of cosmetic stuff, and it was super busy, great experience. My second fellowship, I went and did in vascular birthmarks because I had met a guy named Milton Weiner, who is like the god of birthmarks in, in the world, and I went and trained under him to do vascular birthmarks. Now I had all my dreams come true because I was doing pediatrics. I love kids birthmarks is a lot, a lot of pediatric plastic surgery. I was doing tumors, but they're not malignant tumors. They're benign tumors. They're birthmarks because birthmarks are tumors. And I'll go through them just so you get an idea. But birthmarks are tumors. They're vascular tumors. And for me now, I was cutting out these cancers on kids, but they're benign. Nobody's dying. And it was like the best of all worlds. So I'd move back to LA and I'd start my practice and I would do cosmetic reconstruction and birthmarks. And that's where I thought my life was going to go. And I moved to LA, I set up my practice in Beverly Hills. Um, when people are deciding where to go, they usually just look for a job. Uh, the reality of it is there will always be demand for what you do unless you suck. So if you're somebody good at what you do, there's always gonna be demand and you should never base it on just the job unless you're really obsessed with academia and you really, really wanna be at a top university and you know the top universities around you don't have any jobs. Then you sacrifice it and you move. For me, the more important thing was moving where I wanted to live and it didn't matter for me if there's competition or not. Competition is not in my like uh, you know vocabulary. I don't think about competition. I don't care about competition. I just wanna live my life, do my thing and things will come, things will always work out. And so that's what I did. I moved to Beverly Hills and I opened up my practice just by renting from somebody their space. I had low overhead. My overhead at that point uh, was like 4,000 a month and I floated it by doing some surgeries and uh, you know, first month was tough and that's it. After that, it was easy. $500,000 a month just for my office. Uh, so it's substantially, substantially terribly worse. So I've been trying to work on that and get it down, but that's where life took me. And immediately I became busy. I, be, I was probably the youngest uh, busy person, I'd say, in the country without any substantial marketing. And got busy at doing injectables and facelifts and lip lifts and nose jobs and all that kind of stuff. And I was doing a lot of birthmarks still. But within the next year, it all went cosmetic. And you don't really choose your niche. You don't choose what happens to you. Uh, the demand will kind of take over. So whatever people demand. And You'll see if you're really, really good at something or better than other people, or you're good at marketing, um, whatever drives it, the demand will choose what you do, not so much what you choose always. Um, and I, I, I kind of abandoned ENT. I was never gonna do ENT ever again. So I just did facial plastics. And now I'm pretty much all cosmetic. So um, the parts that I'll focus on is kind of the mix. This is like a lecture about kind of the mix of stuff that I do. So. Um, you'll see when you're treating birthmarks, you have to have an aesthetic approach to it. And that's what I want to talk about. This is kind of like how I see things and what I do. And it's a mix of cosmetics, facial reconstruction, revision work, scar, you know, th these are all the stuff that I do. And when I do birthmarks, they all kind of come in together. So um, I used to like to publish a lot and I haven't been able to because I've been so busy, unfortunately. So if, uh, the thing I didn't mention is my work hours. So you, if you actually read surveys about doctors, doctors have some of the best work hours of any profession in the uh, uh, entire US. They have some of the lowest work hours, funny enough. You wouldn't think so, but they do. So when you go to real life, you can have really nice work hours. My work hours are not so nice. I work 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And I work Saturdays a lot of the time, and I even have to go in on Sundays sometimes. Now, I let my practice get away from me. It's, I kind of say yes to everything. And I used to do, tons of injectables. I was the busiest single injector as a single person in Beverly Hills. And I completely gave up injectables like Botox and fillers. And now it's all surgery. And I was working 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. before until on a Saturday I was operating and I got a heart arrhythmia. I got something called PVCs where uh, preventricular contractions where your heart kind of 
uh, beats out of rhythm. And uh, that day I decided, okay, I got to take it easy. So I stopped working Saturdays. I started bringing my work hours down, went from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. or 5 a.m. sometimes to 10 p.m. back to 9 p.m., back to 8 p.m. And it took me a couple of years actually to get it down uh, because I wasn't courageous enough just to stop. It's very scary when you're early into practice, you're more successful than people who have been 20 years into practice. Uh, I thought that if I backed off, all of a sudden the momentum would go away. So it scared me. And I just kept doing what I was doing and I'm used to pushing through. Uh, but at some point it gets to you and you really got to back off for your own health. So before COVID, I was able to back off. And then uh, just COVID happens, best time of my life, two months of doing nothing. It was amazing. I started a podcast called The Reality Pill and then go back to work. And again, I'm back to 5.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. every single day. And that's usually in the office till like seven or eight. And then I go do FaceTime consults for another two hours. So it's gotten away from me again, and I'm trying to wind down. And I, uh, I do a lot of lectures. Uh, this is the first one I'm doing for you know, pre-med or med students, but I do a lot of lectures for doctors uh, in, you know, around the world. So I'm doing a lot of lecturing on top of this. So when I go home, I have to prepare for a lecture and do that kind of stuff too. But either way, publications, I wasn't able to do for a while, and now I'm getting back into it. I have probably 25 publications that I, I want to get out, and I just need to find a good slave to help me. Um, so when we're getting to birthmarks, uh, birthmarks, there are different kinds. Uh, you have things like hemangiomas, you have venous malformations, lymphatic malformations, uh, glomovenous malformations, AV malformations, which is arteriovenous malformations. Uh, you have all these different things. And uh, people mistake them a lot. And when you go through med school, you're going to learn about a variety of them. And they're going to ask pretty basic questions about what they are and how to treat them. But the basic questions that they're going to ask are like hemangiomas versus capillary malformations or vascular malformations. Um, are they there at birth and then grow or do they grow later? They just ask like when they're present and they're always wrong uh, because the classic teachings of hemangiomas and vascular birthmarks are incorrect, uh, but still they ask you anyways. And I'll, I'll go through it as we see the different cases, but the way to treat birthmarks, and these are birthmarks that can grow out of your face or make your face red or blue, all these different things, is you have excision and closure, meaning you can cut out the birthmark. You have Mohs techniques, meaning you cut out the birthmark, then you need to throw skin flaps to close it, uh, you have tissue expanders. So you have to, on some of them, you're gonna cut out so much skin that you can't do it without doing a tissue expander. So you expand the skin out, it grows, and then you have extra skin to use. You have laser ablation. That means you're gonna use uh, laser to get the color out of these things. And then you have laser resurfacing, sometimes to smooth them out or nodules that form from them because other things can happen too. And then you have sclerotherapy, uh, where you try to actually get rid of the lymphatic or venous malformations or AV malformations, where you're trying to shrink those things rather than operate on them. Uh, so looking at like the treatments that you have specifically, I, I like to teach this kind of stuff to other surgeons so they get birthmark treatments is not just about getting rid of the birthmark. You have to do a lot for what's happened around it. You have to do facelifting sometimes, rhinoplasty, which is a nose job. You have to do brow lifting, just like for facial paralysis, because a lot of these people are treated like facial paralysis patients where one side of the face is drooping down. Cantopexy, cantoplasty, meaning putting the eye back up into its normal position by tightening it. Otoplasty, so you have to put the ear back because it grew too big, or you have to take out skin or cartilage, lip augmentation, fillers you can use to help people, facial implants for people who have like a recessed chin plus a birthmark, which I'll show you. Um, and then you have all these other things that are like not as invasive, like PRP injections, fat transfer to help even out the sides of the face, fat reduction or liposuction, buccal fat reduction. Instead of taking out the vascular tumor, you can actually remove buccal fat to make a cheek look smaller. Kybella, which melts fat, hair transplants for people that lose hair, medical tattooing. There's all these different things that you have to think about when you're treating birthmarks in order to give somebody like a really good outcome. So one of them is a facelift. And facelifts, uh, I just thought I'd introduce you guys to it. Facelifts classically were called rhytidectomies, meaning you get rid of wrinkles. And the classic way that doctors used to do it was lift up the skin like this, called a subcutaneous facelift. And they pretty much just stretch the skin back and put it back down. The issue with this is because you're going so, so superficial, you haven't released any tension 
in the drooping of the face. It's not just that you formed wrinkles, the face drooped over time. And this is soft tissue, this is not just skin. So just pulling back skin doesn't make any sense. You, you went down in six layers of the face and you only brought up one, it makes no sense. So this had a lot of scarring, minimal improvements and people would usually pull in the wrong vector, giving people a pulled, stretched or tight appearance, didn't look great. Then they said, okay, you know what? Let's try to uh, lift up the SMAS and release a, a deeper layer uh, in the face so we can actually get a better lift out of it. And the SMAS, what it is, it's the superficial musculoaponeurotic system. And when I'm looking at the face, I look at it as, uh, let's see, I'll show you kind of this. If you look at the bottom over here, you've got these different layers in it. And the way I look at it, uh, this is the zygomatic arch, which is kind of a dividing plane right over here. Uh, but the way I look at it is you have skin, you've got fat, you've got SMAS, so your superficial musculoponeurotic system that we talked about. Then you've got your mimetic muscles, your smiling muscles. You have another fat compartment, and then you have periosteum, which is where the covering of the bone is. So you have those layers. Um, the SMAS is a very important structure to manipulate because it sits on the gliding lady, uh, it sits on the mimetic muscles of the face in a gliding plane, and it has more of a tendency to droop over time relative. So the top three layers droop more relative to the bottom three layers with age. They kind of, this shrinks, that shrinks, and they slide over each other like that. So releasing it in this plane makes most sense. And this applies here in the face where it's SMAS, this is SMAS area. Here to here is platysma muscle. The platysma muscle is a continuation of the SMAS. And then up here, the temporoparietal fascia is a continuation of the SMAS. Uh, and that's the plane that you wanna lift when you're doing a brow lift. So this, this SMAS layer, releasing it and lifting it is the most substantial, important uh, thing to lift or release in the face. And face lifting, neck lifting, all this kind of lifting, the only way it really works is if you release the tension and you lift it back up, put it back down with no tension. Uh, a lot of doctors classically would have just pulled up tight, thrown a stitch and thrown a bunch of stitches try to redistribute the tension, but that causes a lot of scarring because you're not getting rid of any of the tension. The tension's there, it's just on multiple points. It doesn't get rid of it. So still you get scarring as the face pulls back down and scar forms in its wake. So I do everything in a deep plane or a sub SMAS plane and that SMAS is very important to manipulate. The reason other doctors don't so much is because they're scared of what's underneath, which is the nerves, the nerve, the facial nerve. The facial nerve is your motor nerve, cranial nerve seven. Comes out here in the stylomastoid foramen uh, which you can see kind of under the parotid gland over here, back where the, um, the uh, sternocleidomastoid attaches up here, right in front of it is an indentation on the mastoid. And if you go a centimeter deep there, uh, you have your stylomastoid foramen, which is where the nerve comes out. Your facial nerve controls all the motor function in your face. And it's got branches that go down here into the neck called the cervical branches. It's got marginal mandibular, uh, got your buccal branches, your zygomatic, and then your frontal or temporal branches. So uh, most doctors are scared to go into that plane because they are not familiar with where the nerve lies. The nerve actually lies in one plane deep to that, which is under the musculature. So it's not at risk unless you don't know what you're doing, but that is what it is. So either way, um, that's what I like to, how I like to look at the face and even with lips and lip lifts and things like that, I like to do it in a deep plane. This uh, is what I was talking about. So they, the, the middle improvement people made was called doing a SMAS plication. They would grab the SMAS, lift it up a little bit and pull it back. Uh, not a huge improvement on the skin only, but a little bit of tension is released. You get a little bit better contouring in the neck. Still not a super long lasting one unless you're a very talented surgeon. Uh, very talented surgeons can get away with a SMAS facelift. What I do is something called an extended deep plane. And the idea is that you release everything in the face and then you lift it back up from whence it came, meaning you go back in the same vector uh, that you drooped in. So if you droop this way, which is perpendicular to these lines, you go right back up that way. So um, that's done by releasing all these areas of tension in the face, which is the ligamentous attachments in the face and you pull up against it. So you can see, uh, and these are photos taken from one of uh, our articles that we published, I think like six years ago or something. So this is kind of what it looks like going into that deep plane and I'll, I'll show you so here's what we're doing. This is a what a, this is what the facelift looks like when I do it. Uh, but this is Andrew Giacono. He was my fellowship director. He's uh, doing this one right here. And this is the skin that's elevated, very light layer of fat on top of what we call the reticular dermis, which is the bottom side of the dermis. 
And here we're cutting into uh, the deep plane, meaning we're getting under the platysma muscle, which is here, which turns into SMAS right here. Here now you can see there's a dissection happening and there are no blood vessels here. This just opens up in an easy glide plane and we're getting under the platysma uh, called a deep plane. Now this is getting into the mid face portion where we're going over the mimetic muscles under the SMAS and over the orbicularis muscle. And that releases that tunnel, you release that tunnel. These are called your zygomaticocutaneous ligaments and we go release those, advance forward, advance down, release the platysma from the sternocleidomastoid uh, right there. And then now you have one continuous flap. The benefit of this is that you released all the soft tissue that's drooped over time. So that lifts up at this, uh, equally, same as the skin, not in a different vector. And it keeps more of a, a healthy blood supply, which is always at risk when you do a facelift and gives you just more contour, more lifting, more everything. So there's a lot of benefits to doing it this way. And you can see here, we're throwing stitches into the platysma and then into the SMAS and tacking it up higher in the face again from whence it came. And once you do that, you have all this skin excess that needs to be trimmed and it's trimmed with no tension, zero tension. And that's how you get a, a good facelift in case you guys were wondering what a facelift is. So that's that, looks like this at the end and then later it looks even better. So we have publications on this that we did to show the three-dimensional changes in the mid phase, the volume, how to do it, you know, exciting things like that. If you guys want to try this at home on your parents and uh, it's a, uh, you know, big benefit. So this is, uh, this is Chris Jenner's sister who you can see before had a lot of weight in her face and heaviness and uh, drooping in the upper eyelid and lower eyelids look tired. And this is after doing what I call a comprehensive aura lift. This is the kind of lift that I do. And it makes a nice big difference. Uh, this one we actually did on her wide awake on inside edition, I think, or E it was, I think it was on E news. And uh, you can see she looks more like Chris now. And it's actually Chris Jenner's birthday tomorrow. If you guys want to call and say happy birthday to her, she's the best person in the freaking world. So this is the side view and you can see the neck gets tightened, the face gets lifted. And as much as the photo looks different, this is what I love about my work is I'm obsessive neurotic and I love to do something and then go look at it. I don't, this is why I didn't want to go and do colon surgery where you go just cut up the abdomen, close it up. Nobody knows what you did in there. I like people to judge me. I like to like have people go, oh my God, you're so good. Like I, I need that reinforcement in my life. If not, I feel like a loser. So that's how I am. I'm very needy, I'm codependent also. So uh, because of that, I like to go back and look at my photos and it's my favorite thing when I look at a photo and, and I criticize and I say, you know what? I could have done better here. I could have done better there. And that's kind of, you know, it's, it's sad for me but it's also fun because then I get to go try new things and keep getting myself better. And that's really, if you wanna be a good surgeon you gotta do that your whole life. You can never sit there and be like, Oh my God, I took a shit and it's gold. Like, that's not how life works. You have to look at it every time and say, you know what? I could have taken a better shit. I could have done a better job. And that's how you keep progressing. And this is when you go into med school, they teach you from the beginning. They say, this is a world of research. You have to do research. You have to contribute. And realistically, like when you're in there, you're like, I don't want to do research. This is stupid. I want to just go practice medicine. But if you want to be a good doctor, you have to have that research brain or else you're never going to change. You're just going to wait for somebody to force you to do something different. In plastic surgery, most plastic surgeons don't change unless it, it is like really necessary, meaning they're not getting any more business. And so, cause everyone else is doing it better. So then they have to go change their ways. Most of them are like that, sadly. Um, it's not, you know, like this where you stare at it and you just tell yourself you're shit the whole time. You're terrible, you're terrible, go make yourself better. Um, but realistically, that's how medicine should be. You keep looking at things, you keep trying things, you keep getting it better. The practice of medicine is that. So you can never sit there and think, you know what? I'm perfect. I'm perfect. You're, you're not perfect because there are complications that happen. There's healing time issues that happen. People get imperfect results. People need revisions. That means that the practice is not perfect. Okay. With blood pressure medications, people have side effects. It means it's not perfect. It doesn't fix it. It doesn't make it go away. It's not perfect. So it's our job to keep trying to make it better. And if you're not somebody who's going to make it better then whatever, you're going to be a bland, boring doctor. And I don't know how much you can love your job. Um, but that's the fun of it for me. So the cool thing about this is you see a massive difference from before to after. However, if you were to see her in person, her best friends, her family members, they would not know she did anything, which is the crazy part. You would look at her and they say, Oh my God, did you lose weight? Did you gain weight? Vague things. They can't identify that she did surgery. This lady came to me and I did a face and neck lift for her. 
And she was crying the first couple of weeks because her friends made fun of her and said, why did you go get this done? Uh, you look so crazy. And they just made fun of her. And she started crying at the dinner table. And she's the sweetest, nicest person ever. And another couple of weeks went by and she looked normal like this. And now her friends were actually all jealous of her. So for me, this is fun. It's fun for me, for myself, looking at my before and after saying, oh, good, look what a good job I did. That's what I love. The other part is the gratification. People are so happy afterwards because you gave them confidence. They don't have to wear as much makeup. They don't have to hide from photos. They can gain confidence out of doing such a simple thing. And it's, you know, to me, it's like somebody wears makeup. It's the same thing that they want to go get plastic surgery. And it's the same kind of need to look good. Um, obviously, you're going a lot farther with it, but uh, I, I like doing that. And I love having patients who are like grateful and nice. Being in plastic surgery, I also expose myself to complete lunatics and patients who are very aggressive and hostile and, uh, you know, patients who really have sometimes dysmorphia and things like that, that uh, it makes the field kind of hard. So what I do in my job, half the time I'm being like a therapist and a listener and the other half the time I'm doing surgery. And that's the way that I see it. Um, and I've always like, I talk to people. I like to learn from people. I like to listen to people. So for me, it's not a big deal, but for surgeons who are not good listeners, it does not work out well for them. They have a lot of hostility or kind of a conflict between uh, patients sometimes because patients can get crazy. So, uh, and you see that more in California and New York than you do in other states, certainly. So it is uh, also dependent on geography, how crazy people get. If you go to Texas, when I worked in Texas, people are so nice and they thank you for everything. You like pat them on the back. They're like, thank you for touching me on my back, doctor. You're the nicest guy. They're really, really grateful. And it's so lovely to be at those places. So this is another facelift, lower eyelids, another facelift, ptosis repair. Um, and this is something called a lip lift that I do. And um, the lip lift is a thing that's been around for 45 years, but I developed a new technique for it six years ago when I started my practice. So I've been in practice for six years. I don't know if I told you guys that, but six years ago, I started my practice and I started a deep plane lip lift. And uh, you make an incision under the base of the nose because the lip's too long. And then you go shorten the height of it, bring the lip up, and then you get more tooth show, as you can see over here, and it looks kind of younger, cuter, and nicer. And you can see somebody who looks older, so they say she has a senile upper lip. Senile, people think it means crazy. It doesn't mean crazy, senile just means old. So senile upper lip is a, a totic or hanging upper lip, and now it's cuter and nicer, more appropriate, and her whole face looks younger from that. This is a patient with a cleft lip, and had no definition across the philtrum nor across the vermilion border. So I did a lip lift to just give her a little more accent. This is a patient with asymmetry and hooding on the right side, brought it back up. This is a patient who had silicone placed in her lip and, in, and had bad rhinoplasty, had a couple lip lifts, direct vermilion lift, which is why she has no border here anymore. And I did a very complex lip lift while like this doctor, like the best doctor, ever wants to come watch me and on the day that I have this patient with silicone everywhere bleeding like crazy. That's always how it happens. When you have somebody important watching you, uh, shit always goes crazy. But either way, you know, I've had plenty of that bleed like that. It's not a big deal. Uh, but you can see it makes a big difference. Her whole face looks like it was lifted even though you just shortened the lip. So this is a lot of fun for me. So getting back to birthmarks. Um, I use all those things in birthmarks. So I do mix the cosmetic a lot and it makes me a better birthmark surgeon when I do it. And the things you have to think about with birthmarks is, uh, will it, you know, cause problems for the patient? If you have a tiny little birthmark that has like a little mole, like who cares? It's not a big deal. And the patient cares about it. They care if they don't care, who cares? It's not a big deal. But birthmarks can grow. So you have to think about it from a young age. Is this something that's going to affect their function over time? Is it something where it's going to grow into their eyes? Is it something like Sturgy Weber, where you have to go do um, a brain MRI to see if they have any uh, brain involvement? Is it something like HHT, hereditary uh, hemorrhagic phalangiectasias, uh, previously called Osler Weber Randu, which is going to cause bleeding everywhere? So you have to see if you have to treat these things just because of function. Um, the other thing is the psychosocial aspect. A lot of patients or, or parents of patients come in and they wonder, should I be doing a treatment or a birthmark treatment on my kid? What if they grow up and they think, oh my God, I thought they were ugly. So this is like a real thing they think about and they're worried about that, which in, to me, it's a crazy thought because like the kid would obviously love it if they didn't have a birthmark on their face. Um, and they say, oh, you should embrace, you should embrace, you know, 
your differences. And yeah, I agree. But what happens though, after four years of age is kids, they, their, their, their brain starts to change. Okay. So you guys, I don't know if you've studied uh, language and language development, but there's a sharp drop off in language development after five years old. You also develop different types of recognition. One of the types of recognition is called grandma recognition, where your familiarity with faces starts to change. Um, and you recognize people differently. So you you go away from pattern recognition, but you start noticing different things on people. So uh, this happens around four years of age, little kids start to notice differences between themselves and other little kids. So what if your kid has a big birthmark on their face? Other kids are gonna start pointing it out. They're gonna start, maybe not bullying, but they interact differently with that kid. And when that happens, these kids, sometimes it's a minor thing and nothing happens to their personality, but very often they become very introverted and they seem like kids who have Asperger's or autism and they become very quiet, they're introverted, they're scared to talk, they don't make friends very easily. And that's the reality of it. And uh, you can take that risk, but I prefer if you have a low risk procedure to get rid of a little tiny birthmark, which eventually you know, can grow, then you know, get rid of it. Um, People think hemangiomas go away. They don't just go away. Hemangiomas, some of them go away. Some of them keep growing. Some of them keep growing and then involute later. So you have to really, uh, you know, not treat them like things that just go away because they don't just go away. They can leave a lot of scar tissue where they were and becomes like a, you have a big hemangioma in your head. It goes away. Then you have a, a big white mark that's spongy, old atrophied hemangioma tumor tissue. So it doesn't just go away. Um, the other thing is you have to figure out when to operate. So these kids heal miraculously before four years of age. After four or five years of age, it starts to get a little bit worse. After like seven years of age, they're in this growth spurt and getting towards puberty, towards nine or 10, and now they don't heal well. Then again, they're at adult healing when they're like 10 to 13 and it gets decent again. But you have to use that to your advantage saying, is there a window of time? Do I operate on them now or later? Uh, there's also cancer risk. So um, some of these epidermal nevi or salmon colored nevi, or, um, sebaceous nevi, which are different types of uh, moles, they, they can turn into cancer later, squamous cell carcinomas. And you have to worry about that because once they do, they can metastasize. And the cancer conversion rate is not zero. Uh, so you have to really be careful about that. They can also grow and just become uglier. Um, then looking at hemangiomas versus venous malformations versus lymphatic hemangiomas, you don't, people classically, when you go through pediatric training, you think, okay, it's just one type of hemangioma called an infantile hemangioma, which they say goes away within nine months. That's not true. It can grow for longer than that. It does have a rapid growth phase, uh, usually between that first month and six months, but it can stay for a very long time and then it doesn't just disappear. It can leave uh, issues behind. And you can also have, like me, I had a hemangioma in my throat when I was a baby called a subglottic hemangioma, and those have to be treated because the baby can't breathe. Um, that's why I have brain damage, if you guys were wondering. So hemangiomas are very different than venous malformations, and hemangiomas are very different, infantile is very different than rapidly involuting or non-involuting hemangiomas. There's different kinds. Those can be very damaging. Venous and lymphatic malformations are completely different as well, and you have to figure out how to treat these. So this is a lymphatic malformation on a little three-year-old kid. And he came in with this big mass in the back of his neck. And uh, doctors are not familiar with birthmarks. So they told this kid, you can't operate. You're going to bleed to death. You're going to bleed to death. Okay. But when I saw him, I'm like, first of all, there's no blood in this. It's a lymphatic malformation. It carries lymphatic fluid. And you push on it and it's spongy. And it, it doesn't compress. It's like a balloon. That's a lymphatic malformation versus a venous malformation. If it were filled with engorged large vessels or veins and blood, when you push it, it depresses and then it refills. So it has a different character to it. And ultimately, if you wanted to do an MRI or an ultrasound, that would also show you what it is. Uh, but you can tell just from that physical exam. So for this patient, uh, went around for three years from birth and it kept growing, 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 pushing the ear forward, losing hair on the hairline. And eventually they saw me and I said, no, we can go take care of it. The next week we were at Children's Hospital went and removed it and you have to leave a drain in there because it's uh, produces a lot of lymphatic fluid and you want to uh, prevent a, a seroma. And uh, kid came back a week later, took it out, happiest kid ever, no scar remaining. And it's great because he doesn't have a big bulge in the back of his neck anymore. And believe it or not, that will make a huge difference for this kid growing up. So you can see the, the changes between it. Here's like the cutest little girl. She's 
one of these precocious kids, she's from Iran, uh, speaks English better than me, and came in with, uh, this is a hemangioma. So as you can see, hemangiomas don't go away. So <laughs> they don't always go away, they can go away. Uh, this is a larger hemangioma that stayed there and now she has an atrophied hemangioma, uh, scar tissue basically in the lip over there. And then she has uh, staining in the skin uh, from the hemangioma that did not disappear. Um, and she's six years old, so it's still there. So I did a reduction on the lip, uh, trying to get it a little bit smaller and more functional so she can move it better. And then I did what we call a pulse dye laser to get rid of or lighten the remaining parts over here on the face and neck. Pulse dye laser is a 595 nanometer laser that gets absorbed by red and brown mainly. So you can kill these blood vessels by selectively hitting the blood vessel. It absorbs heat and it thermocoagulates. Um, then you see on her cheek, this is what I was talking about. You got to mix the cosmetic stuff. She has a big bulge here from the hemangioma. So you can say, okay, well, I'll go dissect open her whole face and try to take this out around her nerves or, well, it's usually actually subdermal, so you don't have to go towards the nerves, uh, but you do have to make a cut. Or do I just go inside the mouth, reduce her buccal fat pad and let it tuck in and she looks great. And then later in the future, I can go do that facelift approach on her and get rid of the rest if I want. So that's what I did. And you can see that big bulge is gone. Neck looks a little bit better just from the staining being gone and the lip doesn't protrude as much. Here's another kid, 17 years old, 16 years old at this point. And they used to call him fish mouth and all these like strawberry face and all these different things. This is a port wine stain. A port wine stain is a capillary malformation. So capillary malformation, it is a, a malformation in the capillaries where they don't form the, the wall of the vessels appropriately and they can expand and grow into the skin superficially. These are not things that bleed. Um, they're just kind of staining in the skin and capillaries that are very superficial. So you can actually operate on these. And I went for him, his lip was hypertrophic, meaning it was growing in size and falling out of his face and his chin looked tiny compared to his lip. And this kid was one of those who was just very introverted, didn't talk much, super sweet kid, but you couldn't get a word out of him. So before doing the surgery, I introduced him to my friend. He just started doing jujitsu and my friend is uh, the, the winningest or the most winning uh, jujitsu fighter in the history of the world named Higun Machado. And I took him over there and he trained with him. The next time I saw this kid, after operating on him, we saw him at a jujitsu tournament. His confidence was so high. He was talking, joking around. The time after I saw him, he had a girlfriend now. And this is a kid that you couldn't get one word out of. So um, he had a foul odor in his mouth, lip was falling out, recessed weak chin, blunted jawline. We have to think about facial balance. So what did I do on him? I did two-stage lip, uh, lip reduction. I did a chin implant to push out his chin. I did liposuction in the neck. Uh, I did the pulse dye laser again on the uh, face. I did um, the, the jawline later. I was going to do radio frequency and never got to it. And you can see, you know, these nice little changes for him. He has more of a defined jawline. It looks stronger, has a little bit of a chin now, and the lip is better. And you, you know, you can use one more stage to reduce this part, but for now he's happy enough and it works better. So that's him. You can see it's, you know, it's a lot of fun to do this stuff. And this is another patient and uh, with hemangiomas. So again, when doctors, pedi you know, pediatricians uh, say, don't, don't treat it, hemangiomas go away. It's, it's, uh, it's not the correct thing to do. You can treat them when they're very young with propanolol to shrink it, which is a blood pressure medication that we use to shrink hemangiomas now. And you can even use topical timolol to, sh to superficially shrink like discoid ones or flat hemangiomas. So uh, propanolol works well for hemangiomas. So if this girl had been treated with propanolol in childhood, she wouldn't have these, or less likely to have these tumors there. And the risk of taking propanolol is low. So she has a constricted mouth, she can't move it, has no vermilion, meaning no red to the lip, has two balls over here, a ball over there, another ball over there, and has this droopy chin. Sweetest, sweetest girl. Couldn't close her mouth. So, you know, I think, okay, what can I do to improve her facial balance? And for her, we went and did an excision of uh, these tumors, basically the atrophy tumor, excised it over here, reduced the mass, uh, reduced the mass over here with a little kybella, which is a fat dissolving agent. And uh, then went inside the lip and did a triple VY advancement to bring it out. And then afterwards, uh, oh, we also did buccal fat removal. Afterwards, uh, I did uh, five FU injections, five fluorouracil to soften the scarring that she had. Five fluorouracil is classically a, a 
chemotherapy drug, but we use it off label, meaning without uh, indication that's like an appropriate indication. We use it because we know it's safe and we tell the patients that we use it instead of triamcinolone or uh, Kenalog. Polydocanol I used, which is a sclerosing agent to close off some of the bigger vessels. And then I did a laser on the, the, the rest and I gave her a little bit of filler later as well. And this is her afterwards. So all these tiny little things in there, here and there, and it just gave her a better balance. You can see the jawline has definition now going all the way across. The lip looks better. Um, got rid of the bulges, improved that bulge. And it's not perfect, but you know, everything is better and nothing got worse. And that's really uh, one of the goals when you're doing something complex like this. And you can always stage it and do stuff later, but she looks good. And you're not going to get too much better than that. You can see here from the side as well, the definition of the jawline got a little bit better because she had hemangioma there too. And I liposuctioned it. You can actually go liposuction the area of hemangioma to thin it, which is a cool thing to do. Uh, and you can see the bulges there and there and you know, big difference for her. Uh, I think confidence wise, uh, it helped her a lot. She, she wasn't too shy of a girl to begin with, but I think it definitely did help her a lot. Uh, here's a more simple one. This is a, a patient who uh, was a nurse actually. And, she had this all her life and always had to wear makeup on it. Uh, all she did was come see me and I did a pulse dye laser, which again is that 595 nanometer pulse laser. And uh, we treated a couple of times to get thermocoagulation even here on the lip and I got lighter and better. Now she has blue remaining. And I told her, you know, if you care about that, I don't have the laser, you have to go get an ND YAG laser. So it's a neodymium. Uh, YAG is uh, yttrium, aluminum, gartrite. So uh, so you, you do an ND YAG laser for the blue, which I don't have. Lasers are a whole other topic if you guys ever want to know about lasers. Lasers, uh, I know a lot about just because I did this birthmark fellowship and you have to learn a lot about the physics of lasers to understand what you're doing and what you have the potential to do and the damage to do uh, to, to, to everybody with a different treatment. So looking at this, you see this cute little baby who's so adorable. And uh, the pediatrician said, no, don't treat the hemangioma, it's going to go away. But these, you know, patients, the, the parents thought, you know what, what if it doesn't go away? Let me go ask somebody else. So they found me and they asked me, and they said, what would you do, doctor? Do you think it's going to go away? I said, well, I don't think it's going to fully go away. It's going to get lighter over time, but it's going to leave something. If I were you, I would do uh, a treatment on it. And our treatment options are propanolol, which you can take orally, but can have some systemic side effects. So we don't just give it willy nilly. Um, and the others are laser and topical timolol, which is that eye uh, beta blocker. It's just an eye drop beta blocker. So I prescribed them the eye drop beta blocker and they put it on there uh, every single day, twice a day. And then they came back for a laser to shrink the tumor uh, and over a couple of sessions, you can see it got a lot lighter and it's not invisible, it's not gone, but it's certainly much better than it would have been if we had let it grow. That's the concern is if you don't treat this, it's gonna grow over the next six months. And then that has to involute and recede. And then you're left with all that tumor tissue, which would start distorting the lip. So for me, that was uh, an easy decision. Um, so I would say, you know, for me, when I'm looking at things um, on the face, I like to appreciate beauty. I don't go around and stare at people all day and say like, I want to fix you, I want to fix you, but I am an observer. So uh, it's within me to look at people, not to judge them, not to look at them and say, I want to operate. Most of the time I don't want to operate on people. I think they're, they're you know, beautiful looking, unless they're like angry, bitter assholes, then yeah, I look at their face and I want to fix everything. But if they're like nice people, I look at them and I don't judge them. I don't look at them like that at all. But I do look to see, okay, what makes everybody unique, what makes everybody beautiful, both those things. And I like observing, I like seeing in my work, what can I make better? And part of what I've realized over time with beauty is that symmetry is absolutely not beauty. That's false, it's completely false. And it's extremely overly simplistic. And uh, it is because people don't understand. So they try to think of the simplest thing, which is, okay, well, I understand I like symmetric things. So that means a symmetric face must be more beautiful. And look, Brad Pitt's symmetric. And like, no, Brad Pitt's not symmetric. Nobody's symmetric. So what the reality is, is that there's a range that we're accustomed to as people. You know, you're used to seeing people with two eyes, a nose and a mouth. You're used to seeing things that are common. And that means you're used to seeing in that little bell curve, the most common things, the extremes kind of stand out, the outliers stand out to you. 
And the outliers and symmetry are things that are completely symmetric, look wrong. They look like a robot. Things that are completely asymmetric, like Quasimodo, look wrong. So those are things that, yes, they go against beauty. However, the rest of the asymmetries, mild asymmetries, moderate asymmetries, they're beautiful. They give people character and it, it, it gives them a flow to their face. And if you look at somebody taking a photo, nobody who has any taste is going to stand in a photo like this, rigid and be symmetric. It looks stupid. They kind of stand to the side. They do this. They, everybody has a flow to them and beauty has a flow to it. Just like you're looking at a, a landscape. It doesn't have to be symmetric. The face has a nice flow to it and it gives character. Um, so I, I look more at the balance of the face, how well the things sit together, fit together. You just want them to blend and everything to be pleasant and nice to look at. So that's what, what I focus on is keeping things natural, trying to do that for everybody. Um, you know, they asked me to, to give a little bit of a quote and uh, it's funny because you'll see this as you go through your training. There's a lot of competition between specialties. Like if they do the same thing, they're called turf wars. Turf wars are ridiculous. Uh, turf wars in my world, it's like plastic surgeons saying, uh, facial plastic surgeons are nose pickers and they can't do facelifts and they can't do, you know, whatever. And uh, in the head and neck world, it was the thyroid surgeons saying the other thyroid surgeon, the general surgery ones saying the head and neck surgery ones don't know anything about it. The head and neck surgery ones say the general surgeons don't know anything about it. And it's stupid. So ortho versus neuro for spine, same exact thing. The neuro spine people are like, oh my God, these are ortho frat boys. They don't know anything about spine. So the quote for you guys is competition between surgical specialties. It, it reminds me of clicks in high school. Everybody thinks, you know, that, that theirs is the best. Um, really, once you get into the real world, and this is the reality of it, it doesn't matter which specialty you are, as long as you're doing something that you're supposed to be doing, meaning, you know, nothing out of, you know, the realm of ordinary for your specialty. Uh, but all that matters is that you're the best at it. It doesn't, uh, matter, for example, for facelifts, if I'm a facial plastic surgeon or a plastic surgeon, it makes no difference. What matters is how good am I? How trained am I? And really who excels is the person who does it better than everybody. So you keep improving yourself. So that's it. Um, you know, we'll go through questions now. If people have questions, you guys got to show me how to answer them or where we're looking. But um, if you guys need to contact me for anything, it's Dr. Talia at Beverly Hills Center .com. Uh, I answer probably like two, 300 texts by middle of the day on my phone, even though I'm working and then I have emails to an equal extent. So don't be surprised if I don't see it. <laughs> and my Instagram is Dr. Ben Talley. And on there, um, if you have any interest, it's kind of cool to see the different, not the different things that I do, but I, I like to explain things a lot. I teach a lot, I do a lot of lecturing. So you'll see a lot of explanation of things that I do. And then you can see how psychotic a doctor may appear and that you guys are equal to be as crazy as I am. Um, and that's it. So let's, uh, oh yeah, this was my office when I was building it, but my office looks something like this. I kind of made it like home you know, where I wanted it to look nice. All right, so girls, you wanna show me how to answer questions? Even though Thank we have- Thank you so, so much, Dr. Tillet, for such an interesting presentation. Um, we all loved your personality and how genuine you are. I found myself laughing so much. Um, thank you. <laughs> Everyone, make sure to check out his socials. His Instagram is Dr. Ben Tillet. And um, as for questions, we sent it in the chat box. All right, let's find this chat box. And I'll be sending more. Let's see, where is this chat box? You might have to click more. Chat, yep, there you go. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So let's find it. So from students, how do you minimize scarring during surgery? So uh, it depends what kind of surgery. In general, the most important thing is to have no tension on your closure. So uh, the way healing works is you put two pieces of skin or tissue back together. And over time, that scar over three years and, and beyond goes through changes. They used to say it was like eight months when they taught us in med school, but if you have any brain or vision or sight, you know that's not true. So um, you put skin back together, let's say, and the different things that can make it scar are tension, number one, because uh, 
if there's tension on this and it's pulling apart, the area that's weakest is going to be the one to spread and pull away. So that's where scar forms, meaning as it pulls away, you start forming uh, scar tissue, which is like, uh, you don't have the dermis fully there and just the epidermis grows over. So it becomes atrophic scar. The other is tension and it's not pulling apart. You get hypertrophic scar. And the other is keloids. Keloids uh, can form from uh, sensitive skin that has some tension on it, or it's done in a weird place, or it has an irritant. And keloid is like a tumor. It's very different than a hypertrophic scar. Most people have hypertrophic scars, red raised, a little bit shiny, that's hypertrophic. Atrophic is like uh, a uh, stretch mark. And then keloids are like tumors. They actually grow like people ear, people's ears, it comes out like a, like a ball. Um, so that happens mainly because of tension, uh, the, you know, those different things. So number one, you get off tension, which means let's say you have two pieces of skin. If you didn't have to lift anything or pull anything, you just put them back together. But let's say you cut out this much skin, you have to actually release this much skin to get these things back together without tension, redistribute everything, get it to lay into a new area. The other thing is about the volume under it. So if you put things back together, they can sink over time if you got rid of volume underneath. So you have to make sure the volume underneath comes together as well first, then that's together. The last thing is how you stitch it, okay? So how you stitch it is very important as well. So uh, we throw things that are called deep dermal sutures. So we throw dermal sutures and that brings the dermis back together and uh, gives it a little bit of eversion or just brings it back together with some strength because the dermis is where the strength is, epidermis, dermis. The other is about eversion. Because over time, a, ten, a scar tends to go through these different inflammatory phases where uh, cells come in and heal it, and then it contracts and it inverts, and scars tend to invert over time. So our tendency to close should be to evert it. And when you evert it, you take out the stitches, it relaxes a little, but at least you got dermal opposition, meaning the dermis contacted dermis and is getting better connection as it goes back down, and it keeps growing dermis. So now at least you have dermis underneath in those wounds. Um, so, you know, that, that's the main thing. And then afterwards, you can always do lasers and things like that to resurface and get it better. Um, how thorough am I with psychologic evaluations before surgery? So um, this is all about tact, especially in plastic surgery, where you do have dysmorphic patients, hostile patients. You have extortionists, professional extortionists who want to come get something and then they extort you right after. So um, I'm very careful now because I don't want these people in my life. If I'm going to operate on somebody, I have to think to myself, would this person, would I also go to dinner with them? Would I also want to hang out with them? If the answer is no, I don't want to operate on them. I don't want somebody in my life who's not going to be friendly, logical, and nice, or someone that I would want to normally hang out with, because it makes an already difficult process more difficult. So during surgery, you're making, some, especially elective surgery, cosmetic surgery, you're making someone sick, you're hurting them. And then hoping that their body heals to get them better. So that's already a complex process. On top of that, you put someone who's not psychologically, you know, agreeable in that situation. And now it's a disaster. And in the beginning, I thought I was a hero. I thought, you know what, I can save everybody. I can help everybody. And this person, they're a little crazy. They've been through a lot. I want to help them. I can achieve a great result. And that's going to make them happy because that's what they came to me for. The reality is no. Unhappy people are just unhappy. Hostile people are hostile. And they went through a bad experience. Whether or not the surgery was bad doesn't matter. Whatever you do for them will not get them to happiness. And I realized that. And if it's not going to do that, all it's going to do is make you miserable. And I was miserable several times. I'm miserable lately again for a patient who called me uh, just crying and saying I'm distorted. And I didn't pick up that she had body dysmorphia, facial dysmorphia. Um, and you look at her photos and the photos are objective, meaning they're not subjective, they're objective. You look at it and the fact is right there. And her photos look amazingly better from one to the other, from the after, if you compare the after to the before. And if you show it to hundred people, 100 people will agree, which means what she's seeing and I'm not seeing might not be reality for the rest of the world. And that's uh, called facial dysmorphia or body dysmorphia. And I didn't pick up on it before, even though I wrote in my note, I repeatedly told this person so-and-so, which I never write. You have to repeat things 20 times. You probably shouldn't be operating on that person. But that's my fault. I took on this patient. I let her into my life. And she's not a terrible person, but she's going through all this stress. And I should have picked up that this is not a person you want to operate on again. Um, 
she had two revisions prior and I had to fix it. Uh, so either way, I wish I could send people for psychological evaluations prior to surgery. Some doctors do in plastic surgeries, but it's a risky move to make to be like, hey, go talk to a psychologist. I think you might be crazy. People won't come to you. Uh, or they go write bad reviews and you make enemies and they start ruining your life. So you have to be a little selfish with these things, unfortunately, uh, and think how much do I want to sacrifice and ruin my life? Or am I going to find a better way to do this? Will I just analyze them myself and say, listen, uh, this person in my mind is a little crazy. They're a little dysmorphic. They're seeking something I cannot achieve. And if that's the case, then you think to yourself, should they never get something or should they just get out of my office and go to somebody else? Because they do need something, but I don't want to do it. If they should never get something, you do have an obligation to try to help them. And you don't tell them they're dysmorphic and crazy because they're not going to listen to you. You try to guide them as much as possible, maybe scare them out of doing things by saying, you know what, there's a lot of risk. There's a lot of this. You're a patient who doesn't have good luck with surgery. This is actually reality. You just don't have good luck with it. You need to be cautious about how much surgery you do. It's going to make you worse. You're going to have, you're, if anything goes wrong, it's going to happen in somebody like you. And most people take that and they say, okay, you know what? I understand. Some people go write a bad online review about you and say, oh my God, he told me I just have bad luck with surgery. Well, yeah, I was just saying you're kind of crazy and maybe you shouldn't be doing surgery because you have nervous healing. People don't think psychosomatic issues are real. They are real. If you're nervous during your healing process, you will have more problems. It's not a maybe you have more problems. You will have more problems. And it's because physiologically things change in you. If somebody has a panic attack during a surgery, they will start bleeding like crazy. It's because physiologically something is happening. It's not just that their blood pressure goes up. They actually have a change in their TPA, their, their tissue plas uh, plasminogen activator. And they actually start bleeding more because their blood thins. So these things are real. Um, either way, that's the long answer to a short question. But yes, in you do have to psychologically evaluate. And it does take a very long time to figure out intuitively who the people are you need to stay away from or how to guide them to other people uh, who can help them and can deal with them. Um, because I'm not good at dealing with it because I'm too realistic. I'm not a fluffer. I can't sit there and tell something, you know, somebody something that's not real. I'm very genuine. And it's hard for me to just tell someone, okay, okay, you know, keep talking shit to me, keep blaming me for everything. It's hard for me to take that when I know it's a perfect job done. So um, do you ever perform gender reassignment surgeries? So I don't do, uh, so th there, there are surgeries that we call gender reassignment. You have feminization, you have masculinization. Um, I, I don't specifically do them. I'm a facial surgeon. In the face, what they come to me for during this process of um, facial feminization is they come to me for lip lifts, they come to me for face lifts usually. They don't come to me for rhinoplasty because to feminize somebody through a rhinoplasty, you have to make them look fake. And I would rather cut my arm off than make somebody look fake. So I can't do that for them. I will not do that for them. If they want to look feminized through a rhinoplasty or look fake through a rhinoplasty, I think they already know that. They don't come to me for that. They go to somebody else who will make it a little more pinched. And you kind of makes it look feminine because it looks like a fake feminine rhinoplasty. So, uh, but I do participate in doing the lip lifts and the facelift. And it's really great to do that because, you know, th th these patients, it's not a stress-free population. They have a lot of stress going through the process. Uh, some of them have hormonal changes that they're going through too. And now you're adding on a giant confounding variable in everything that you're doing because their body might heal differently. They might have different acne formation in the skin if they're taking testosterone. Uh, they might have oily sebaceous, so their scarring changes, or they might legitimately just be hormonally erratic. They're going through these hormonal changes and they get fluctuations in emotion. And that makes it very difficult to go through. So you do have to be cautious during gender reassignment surgery and make sure the patient isn't just starting hormonal therapy. They have to be stable and you want to wait till they're stable before you put their body through like a big stress. So I always ask them, I say, are you doing hormonal treatments? Yes. How long have you been doing it for? Two weeks. Okay. Let's just wait till you do this a little bit longer, get used to the hormonal changes. And then once your body is kind of stabilized, then let's do it. So give it like six months and it takes at least six months. So that, that's kind of been the, the way I do it successfully. Otherwise, if they've been on it for a while, then it's great. And they're a very, very, you know, wonderful, thankful population. I, I really do like working with them. Um, when do I refuse to perform a surgery? All the time. 50% of my consults at this point are spent telling people not to do things. And it is because I now know, not just, you know, me saying who's like hostile, who's crazy, who's aggressive. Who, yes, those things. But it's also about 
can I do a better job than any other surgeon at what they're asking me to do? That's number one. The other is, can I achieve their goals? Do they have realistic goals that I can achieve? Um, those are the two things where I look at, and if they, if they don't get what I can do or they need more than what I can do, I send them to somebody else. If somebody comes to me and I think somebody else can do a better job than I can, I will not touch them because for me, it would be, a, you know, it would just feel pretty shitty to do a surgery on somebody and know that there's this guy in Chicago who can do a better one. If, if they say, okay, you know what? I'm never going to Chicago. It's not happening. Who's the best in LA? I'm only going to do in LA. Okay, I'm the best in LA at it. I will happily do that for you as long as you understand this guy in Chicago can do a better job than I can and go look at his photos so you understand what I'm talking about. So uh, for me, if I can't do the best facelift that exists, I will not do a facelift. Fortunately, I do the best that exists. I do the best lip lift that exists. Rhinoplasty, variable. I do amazing rhinoplasty. I do great revision work. Um, but there are cases where I say, you know what? It's too much for me uh, for whatever reason, whether it's a sixth revision, I don't want to deal with the issues that are going to come. I don't have the infrastructure for it. I don't have the equipment for it. And I send it to somebody else. So I refuse uh, all the time. Do I deal with emergency burns such as face burns? Um, I'm not a burn specialist. Uh, usually if there are emergencies and it just happened and it's second or third degree, they tend to go to the hospital and they get treatment there for it. Third degree, certainly they do. So they need different kinds of treatments. As far as like older burns, uh, burns that were done, you know, happened years ago, I do help uh, with those somewhat. The cool things that I've seen is Patients with contracture, so they get deep contracture where their neck gets stiff or they get something called torticollis um, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, they can have stiffness around the mouth, around the jaw, you know, everywhere where uh, they can scar. I've actually done treatments to loosen it up other than just flaps and skin flaps and things like that. I've actually done injections of PRP, platelet-rich plasma with nanofat. And I take nanofat, meaning you take fat cells, you break them down into what are called mesenchymal stem cells or progenitor cells they're not real stem cells but they're called mesenchymal stem cell or adipose derived stem cells and i mix it with prp and i inject it and it actually softens up scar tissue so that's pretty cool have i ever operated on any celebrities i'm in beverly hills this is like land of celebrities i've actually operated on some of my favorite ones which i actually did a tracheotomy on one of my favorite actors uh of all time and he had um he had throat cancer and I walked in to the emergency room and they're like, yeah, we have somebody that needs some help. And I wasn't even on call. And I go and they said like, you know, here's the guy. And he's in, like, he was one of my favorite actors growing up. And um, either way, he's like bleeding out of his throat. And uh, I see a, the most famous singer in the fucking world next to him. And uh, she's like, hey doc, you know, what do you think? What's going on? I'm like, well, uh, you've got cancer. <laughs> like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, I don't have cancer. I'm like, yeah, you do have cancer. I can see it from across the room and that's why you're bleeding. But why are you telling me you don't have cancer? And he says, well, you know, I'm a Christian scientist. And I said, oh, okay. Um, so Church of Christian Science uh, dictates that, um, that uh, you can only heal through the prayer, through uh, prayer and through the, the help of God. You can't uh, heal yourself scientifically, medically or any other way. So he wasn't allowed to accept that he had uh, get diagnosed with cancer and then he couldn't treat it. So at this point I had to ask, and this is, you know, in med school, you're gonna go through a lot of situations with Jehovah's Witnesses and you have to figure out uh, how to treat them and how to treat their children. And I was figuring out at this point at 2 a.m., um, you know, I was supposed to be at a bar partying with my friends, I'm not on call and now I'm here to, you know, help this guy, uh, what do you do? And so I ask him, I say, well, I understand your religion, but do you want me to help you? And he says, yes. I go, are you sure? He says, yes. I go, you're going with undiagnosed cancer saying it's not cancer. Do you understand that it's cancer? He goes, well, I go, do you understand that it's cancer? Yes. Would you, will you allow me to treat you? Yes. Will you allow me to do anything I need to do to save your life? Yes. And I look at the singer whose name I will not say, and I say, you heard that? Yes. Okay. I go put my finger in his mouth with a gauze and some Afrin and hold the bleeding tumor, which is inside his throat until it stops bleeding. And then I have to go do a tracheotomy on him. So I go do a tracheotomy on him wide awake, petting his head because it's Santa Monica UCLA hospital and they won't let you give him sedation. I had to push myself into the operating room because they wouldn't let me go up without an anesthesiologist there. Um, either way, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. And I did a tracheotomy on him, gave him that and probably took him like two years before he like mentioned to the media that he had throat cancer. But uh, either way, yeah, lots of celebrities in LA and it's no different than any 
normal person. Uh, most of them are normal and nice and some of them are weirdos because they're actors, but um, most are very, very nice. And it's LA, they're just nice people in general. So can you tell if someone has had plastic surgery and or Botox filler just by looking at them? If it's done well, I cannot tell. I've had my own patients that have done facelifts on and lip lifts on and things like that. And I don't see them for a couple of years. And you gotta keep in mind, I do a lot. And I come back in the room and I don't check the chart and I just walk in and I look at them. And I'm like, well, I know you, but are you my friend that I met somewhere or did I do surgery on you? And I can't figure it out. And there's no scars to, uh, to see. And I kind of walk around them. I don't want to seem like an idiot. And then I'm, I kind of look and I'm like, so what are you doing here today? Is this just follow up? And they're like, well, you know, after the facelift, I was thinking, I'm like, ah, facelift. <laughs> so um, if it's done well, you cannot tell and should not be able to tell whether it's Botox filler or surgery. If it's done poorly, then you want to like vomit. It's disgusting. And I fucking hate it. It's the worst thing in the world. I cannot stand fake. It drives me insane. And what you see in LA drives me crazy. I think it's disgusting. It doesn't age well. It makes people look horrible when you have overdone fillers in the lip, when you have overdone Botox and they're stiff. It's gross. People should look pleasant and nice and delicate, not heavy and bulky and operated. Uh, it just, I, I hate operated looks. And as far as judging people, no, I don't judge people who look natural ever or are nice. Again, I judge hateful, angry people. And I look at them because I want to make them look happier. And then I judge people who look operated because it bothers me. I don't like seeing fake things. It just, it's, it offends me. And if I see a fake nose job, like on a girl, I can never date that girl. I just can't do it because I can't sit there staring at her fake nose job, wanting to like poke at it and fix it. I just can't do it. Um, fake lips. I can't do it. I can't date somebody who has fake lips. It's, it bothers me. Um, so things don't bother me. If somebody's beautiful and untouched and I date somebody, I don't want to do anything on them. I don't ever want to touch them. I want them to just remain beautiful and natural. Uh, did I have a mentor and do I think it helped? So everybody's your mentor in medicine when you're going through every doctor you come into contact with even your own pediatrician will be like hey call me if you need anything so um, they're all like that and everybody knows how miserable it was and how lost we were going through this i didn't decide my specialty on them until the last minute i didn't know where i was gonna go to med school to the last minute you kind of yeah you know, these are all stressful kind of choices you have to make and you don't know what to do uh you know i, I was on the um the acceptance committee at UCSD at San Diego for med school. So I kind of went through this whole process and saw all the things that people did, uh, but I had to figure it out on my own. And pretty much everybody you meet who's in medicine or pre-med or med school, they become your mentor. You know, they, they don't have to be above you. They just have to give you advice. Anybody you meet as a doctor, they're going to become your mentor. I had tons. Uh, when I was in residency, I had more than anybody. That's why I came out ahead because I kept visiting different doctors when I had time off. Instead of taking a vacation, I go see other doctors. They all became my mentors. They all taught me something. Even doctors that I looked back in plastic surgery and thought, wow, that guy really did shit surgery. I learned so much from that guy though. So to me, maybe he's a terrible surgeon, but he, for me, he was an amazing teacher and I appreciate that person. And I appreciate what they taught me. I can go see the worst facelift in the world, but the guy had a trick. He had a trick where he did this little thing and he put a tube there. And I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna use that the rest of my life or you see the way they talk to people or the way they run their office. So everybody became my mentor. My main mentors, uh, one of them was in residency and it was Stephen Perlman. He's a rhinoplasty surgeon in New York. He's a faculty member at Columbia University. And uh, he's the one that I would go spend time with the most. And he guided me and told me how to you know, treat people and you know, all these different things. So you learn a lot just about how to talk to people as well as uh, how to do surgery. And he is the one who helped me get my fellowship. My fellowship director was my other main mentor, which was Andrew Giacono. And he's the one who really taught me also how to run a practice, um, how to not, if not manipulate people uh, in, into like, you know, <laughs> the way you want them to act in your practice, to understand them and to listen to them and who to stay away from and the reality of how people act. And you have to be very realistic going through medicine and understanding people. Um, and then my last mentor was Milton Weiner, who was my other uh, fellowship director. And then when I came back to New York, I got plenty of mentors. I got, there's a guy upstairs, Jay Calvert. He's amazing. If I run into issues with a patient, I call him and I say, you know what, what do you think, uh, you know, what do you think I should do? And he gives me the best advice. And there's all doctors in general are willing to help except for the assholes. And there's ones where I, you know, moved to LA and there are competitive people I call this guy who does uh, pediatric ear reconstruction in LA. Um, and he's very, very well known. And 
I try to contact him. God knows how many times barely ever like doesn't call me back. Doesn't email me back. Finally, at some point, the only response he gives me is, Hey, Beverly Hills kind of saturated. Maybe you should go up to Santa Barbara or somewhere farther, which is pretty much telling me to like fuck off and not do surgery there. So you will run into those people, but it's very uncommon. Most of the time doctors, you know, you, if you look at a med student or in med school, it's the nicest people in the world. They want to help everybody. And it's a stark, stark difference from going to a law school like meeting or law school conference. And I remember I would go and like, it was during a, a law school thing. You see all these, like the people who like in high school, you're like, half of them were intelligent. And the other half, you look at them, you're like, oh my God, that guy is such a scumbag. I thought he was just going to end up in jail and they become lawyers. So uh, it's a different crowd, 50-50 um, in, 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 in law. You have really great people and you have the like scumbags. In med school, everybody's nice. Everybody's amazing. And this carries through their practice. They end up being just nice and helpful people. And that's all. So um, those are all the questions I see. Do you guys have any other ones there? Um, someone keeps asking if you can look over botched surgeries on Reddit. I'm not sure what that is, but. I don't use Reddit. Uh, oh. but, but no, I, uh, I don't, uh, I don't like looking at botched surgeries. The word botched bothers me in general because it's overused. So people use the word botched to say a surgery went wrong, but these patients overuse it. They think every little complication, every little irregularity is it's botched, it's botched, it's botched. Um, and botched is a great show. It's a great TV show. It's my, my friend, Paul Nassif is on there. He was one of my mentors. <laughs> um, he's on there and it's a very funny show but everybody says botched. Uh, there is botched plastic surgery, but it's offensive. It's offensively bad. And, um, you know, those are ones that for noses, that's what I fix. For facelifts, that's what I fix. For lips, that's what I fix if it's really botched. But Reddit, no. Any other questions, guys? We sent um, two over in the chat box. Did you know? All right. Do you have advice for reaching out to a physician for shadowing or mentorship? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's usually like any doctors, the, most people, the way they do it is like friends of friends or family friends or a doctor you've been to. And, um, and you just go kind of ask them, can I follow you? And it's fun. And I've had people follow me, med students, pre-med, now it's like impossible because uh, I have so many residents and fellows following me in surgery and you can't even fit more people in the operating room, especially during COVID. And then I stopped doing injectables. So I don't really have many, but uh, in general, that, I mean, that's how you do it. You just kind of find somebody and you're going to fall in love with every specialty you follow because medicine is cool. You're going to go see an internist. And, oh my God, internal medicine is the coolest thing ever. Um, you're going to go see, you know, for, for me, it's like, when I think about like walking around the hospital and changing people's blood pressure medication and then sitting around and talking about it, it's like, you know, we used to call it mental masturbation. It's like, it's not an exciting thing for us, but to each his own it's a, uh, but you will, I did fall in love with it the first time. So you will fall in love with every specialty. And that's why it's nice to, if you shadow somebody, you don't have to shadow them forever. You go shadow them a couple of times and you go shadow somebody in neurology and you're like, Oh shit, neurology is the coolest thing ever. And you go and you do neurosurgery. Oh my God, neuro neurosurgery. They all seem so sexy you know, and you go through all these things. So it's fun to kind of hop around. And um, it just gives you an idea of what clinical practice is like. It's very different than academia. It's very different than um, being in the hospital and being a hospitalist. They're entirely, entirely different. It's very different than med school. Med school and residency are not like real life. And you have to remember that. Like when you go into real life, you choose which kind of practice you want to have. So it is nice seeing those things. It's nice to be in a hospital. In hospital, if you want to volunteer, they usually give you a shit job. You just do it to say you did it. Um, you know, I worked in the supplies distribution department in Santa Monica UCLA Hospital, which is like they put you in the dungeon like a troll, and it's like the worst thing ever. And you like move boxes around. It's so stupid. So, um, you know, the other things I did in my life that I mentioned were more interesting when I went on my uh, interviews, as opposed to everybody else being like, I worked as a candy striper in the hospital, whereas I'm like, well, I I am a race car instructor. I used to race cars. I race boats. I used to do offshore boating. Um, I used to teach piano. I've been composing piano since I was 12. I used to make lampshades. I make Victorian style lampshades. I do carpentry. Here's my carpentry. So 
that kind of stuff that I used to do I actually used to interest them a lot where you had something to talk about during uh, the stuff. You know, everybody at some point is being like, oh, I did a medical mission in Uganda and they think it's like life changing for them and they, that's all they want to talk about. Well, I was on the acceptance committee and like everybody did that. It wasn't that exciting, but it's good to have. Um, in general, just, you know, try a lot of things, do a lot of things, be well-rounded. And if you do that, you you will be passionate about some of these things. And that's what comes out in your interviews when people see like, oh my God, this person has done so much for whatever. Um, so otherwise, let's say you don't know anybody, you could reach out to anybody and ask them, any doctor in your area. And if you want to find a doctor in a specific specialty in your area, you go on US, US World and News Report and you go on Physician Finder. And Physician Finder, you can search by specialty and it will give you every physician within however many miles that you're searching. So if you want it within 10 miles, you search that and it'll come up with every specialist and you can see how long they've been in practice. They could have been in practice 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. And you kind of say, okay, you know what? I want to follow this guy. You contact their office. You say, I'm a med student, pre-med, and I am so interested in this. And do you mind if I come shadow you? Half of them will say yes. Half of them will say, well, we don't really do that. We've never done it. We don't know what you're talking about. But half of them will say yes. It's very easy. Um, not a huge benefit for applying to med school, but whatever. It's still good for your own exposure. And you should do whatever's good for your own exposure. Um, I said I have a podcast. It's, uh, it's called The Reality Pill. On Instagram, I have the reality pill, and then it's on, uh, I think it's on iTunes and YouTube. I'm pretty sure it's on both those things, but for sure. And it's a video podcast, so you can see the video, and it's not just on medicine. It's uh, various topics. I talk with my jujitsu trainer. I talk with a uh, voiceover actress, Tara Strong. I talk all, all these different people who... Um, I feel like their fields are misunderstood and the, the whole purpose of the reality pill is to kind of dispel the myths, dispel the bullshit about what we see in each field. In medicine, we talk about, okay, the bullshit of like, well, everybody says they're doing threads. Here are the trends. Everybody's doing fox eyebrows and looking stupid. Here's why. Um, so that's what we talk about on the medical parts, but I do everything. I do fertility. We talk about a lot of different things. So it is really interesting in case you wanted to learn about the different fields it's pretty cool um and apparently i'm good at asking people questions so um yeah i think the reality pill does have a website too but i don't know if it's functioning i gotta ask my web guy but either way i have a reality pill instagram page and then i think it's youtube and uh itunes and many are asking about my thoughts on the kardashians well the kardashians uh i'm very good friends with a couple of them um, and I think they're the most hardworking family I've ever seen. They, as a family, they work so hard and they're very, very astute business people. And um, Chris, who's, again, I said her, it's her birthday tomorrow. She's the sweetest person in the world and always offering advice and always trying to help everybody. And then Kim's like the sweetest, nicest person ever. And as far as plastic surgery goes, they fortunately don't do much on the face. They're actually very... Uh, mellow on the face. All of them are. Um, Kylie had a little bit too much filler and a very smart, amazing doctor removed it for her. And then she had it refilled, but otherwise everybody else is pretty mellow and they're all very sweet and nice. Um, any recommendations for pre-meds? I mean, that's all the stuff I've been talking about, I guess. I don't know. Nothing more than that, but, you know, do do everything you I, like I, I a lot of the stuff that i did was not typical like most pre-meds don't go and do private investigating you know what but that's what i wanted to do it was fun for me uh, do whatever you want to do your experiences do not need to be purely medical um, you might talk to a very smart person during your interviews you might talk to a total idiot and the total idiot would have very you know parochial views and say Hey, you, how do you know you want to go into medicine? You don't know you want to go into medicine. I had to do this, this, and this before I chose that I want to go to medicine. You don't know what you're talking about. Whereas somebody else would see, okay, you did two medical things, you did 20 other things, and you have so much experience in life that, well, you've seen a lot of things. You've lived a life. You kind of know what you want to do. So there's different ways to look at it. Um, in general, I mean, just get some good exposure, do things that make you look good, do a lot of volunteering for everything. I worked at a pet shelter. It's fun. Uh, if you can go to medical missions in other countries, do it. It's really hard to do though. So like if you ask me, if you can go to a medical mission with our group, which is hugs, 
they have already too many people and it's hard to take more people. So it is hard to go on those, those medical uh, missions. So we go usually twice a year to Colombia, Ecuador, um, uh, Vietnam. Uh, well, there's more countries, but I'm forgetting, <laughs> but it's great. So what's the most interesting case I've had in my career? Mm. I don't know. I mean, I've had the most traumatizing. So the most traumatizing was when I was in residency and I was doing head and neck surgery, I was at Cornell and I was the resident on call. And this 16 year old kid who uh, was, he had been hanging out like maybe, I don't know, six months before by a, like a shoe store or something. And uh, some guy was trying to shoot another guy and the bullet went stray and hit him in the throat. And so he had to go get a tracheotomy and uh, was on a respirator for a little bit. And then, you know, it was fine. Just needed that to breathe. Didn't need the ventilation. Uh, went home and had the trach for a while and then took it out, but developed tracheal stenosis, which means narrowing, stenosis of a narrowing uh, of an area, narrowing and scarring. And uh, got tracheal stenosis and it was progressive, meaning it kept getting worse. And he came into the hospital one night, difficulty breathing uh, with strider, which is, <gasps> that's strider versus stertor is a <sighs> different sound. <clears throat> so he had strider. And he had biphasic strider, which means he was having his, his stridulus going in and out, which is really bad. And that is a high uh, glottic stenosis usually. So pretty bad. And uh, we looked at him and he was still breathing okay, but very panicky. You know, this kid was anxious and as you would be if somebody's like choking you. And we decided at that point with my attending, we said, okay, what are our options? Do we go? Uh, trach this kid, actually he hadn't been trached before. I'm sorry, he hadn't been trached. He had a breathing tube in for a while. That's why he got the tracheal stenosis. You just can't really leave a breathing tube in more than like, you know, a week or two, usually a week is enough. And then you have to trach them. So he didn't get tracked. Um, so we were wondering, okay, do we trach the kid or uh, do we just try to calm him down, give him some steroids, open up his airway a little bit and then schedule him for a tracheal reconstruction right away, which is a lot easier to do if you don't have a tracheotomy in place. So you go and you take rib cartilage and you take the cartilage and you go into the larynx and you cut it, open it and pop in a piece of cartilage to stent it larger. And so we decided at that point, okay, you know, he's gonna be fine. Let's just do that. It'll make his outcome better. Um, next night, the kid has a panic attack and like passes out from just breathing too fast. And the faster you breathe through a narrow uh, airway, you get the Bernoulli's issue, which is uh, you start to get bad airflow through a narrow little area. And he passed out. Not a big deal. He got back up. Um, the next night or two nights later, three nights later, he went home, comes back anxious. And then I get called at like 3 a.m. I'd been up for like, you know, probably like at least three, four days straight. And they call and say, this kid's having a problem. And I say, oh, shit, I run. Because if this kid has a problem, nobody in the hospital can help him. Nobody. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, ICU person that can help him. There's no anesthesiologist that can intubate him. It's impossible for them. And I run as fast as I can. And I get over there. And the anesthesiologist is trying to intubate the kid and can't do it. And the kid is already cyanotic. He's blue. And so with no gloves, with nothing, I'm like, oh, shit. And I just grab my knife and I put a hole down into his trachea, open it. I don't have any instruments or anything. I put my finger in there, dilate it, grab a breathing tube because I don't have a tracheotomy. And I throw the breathing tube in there and we start ventilating the kid. But at this point, he had gone under cardiac arrest as well because uh, his breathing was depressed for so long. You got no oxygen to the heart. The heart doesn't work anymore. So he went from respiratory. He went from... Uh, difficulty breathing to actual respiratory arrest to cardiac arrest. And so uh, they resuscitate him and the heart comes back and uh, the kid ultimately, uh, we go convert the breathing tube to a tracheotomy and he goes to the ICU and he wakes up with severe brain damage. So for this, I was crying for probably like, like I don't like talking about it. I started like tearing, but I was crying for like three, four days straight. So you know, it's like a young kid, 16 years old. And uh, we think back and it's something where you think, okay, like, could I have helped this kid better? And in this situation, we had a big conference about it, not just us, but the pediatricians. And 
we said, yeah, you know, we could have helped this kid better. We could have just traked him. It would have been better to do the tracheotomy on him uh, right away to, to, you know, maybe he doesn't get as good of an outcome, but at least you don't risk what, what we risked. And there was no right answer. You know, the kid comes in, he's doing okay, 16. You think he, he's been managing like that for months. You think he can manage a couple more days plus steroids to open it up, but it didn't work out that way. So the kid ended up with permanent brain damage, which means you're dead. I mean, he's, you know, he was alive, but unresponsive. And the family ended up suing the hospital. We had a bunch of um, conferences to see if it could have been treated any better. And, you know, for, for all the other doctors, they didn't really understand the, um, the choices that for them, it's always a mystery. Like, well, you know, shouldn't you have done it? Cause you don't really know what's going on. And we're saying, no, we know what's going on. You guys can't see it. We have cameras. We see it. We saw it. We know exactly what's going on. It wasn't a mystery. Um, it's just more, a man, uh, you know, a question of management. And I think everybody learned a lot from that. And from that point on, uh, anybody who was in our program who wasn't already uh, extremely cautious or overly cautious became overly cautious. So when I went, you know, to the hospital and I, I saw this guy bleeding out of his throat, I didn't think to myself, okay, maybe I'll maintain him overnight, take the risk. No, I realized if this guy goes into a shitstorm of bleeding overnight, I'm not there. I can't help him. And who's there? There's not going to be a, you know, a, an anesthesiologist who might be great at intubating a bleeding patient. It's, it's unlikely. So if anything were to happen, even if it's a one in 1000 chance in that one in 1000 case, this guy would not make it out. So I thought to myself, okay, you know what? I'm not, I can't take that one in 1000 chance because even if it's a one in 1000 chance, it's not a, maybe he's going to make it out of, okay. He'll be, uh, you know, terrible. At, uh, uh, he, he died. So sorry. I read a question at the same time, got distracted. So any tips for time management? No, I have horrible time management. I, I'm terrible. I'm very efficient. I get a lot done. So uh, people are always shocked at, you know, how I don't die um, because I get so much done in a day. I do lecturing, I teach, I operate, I do injectables, I do seminars, I do podcasts. I still try to play piano. I still cook. I do a bunch of, you know, different things. I have a cooking channel. If you guys want to see Ben Talley's kitchen, Instagram, uh, my own recipes, but I have no good tips for time management because I'm terrible at it. And I do too much is my problem. Um, I do more in one day at work than my friends do in one week. And that's uh, hopefully not going to be true anymore as I back off, but I'm terrible at time management. I do too much. Uh, so will I present for you guys again sometime? Uh, sure. Go through everybody else. And when you get bored, Happy to talk about any topic you guys need a discussion on. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Teller. We all loved it and we look forward to staying in contact with you. Thank you so much. And everyone, thank you for attending as well. The Google form has now been posted, so please fill it out within the next 30 minutes. Thank you so much again. It's my pleasure. Send me uh, if it 